So thanks uh, everybody for, for coming. Um, and it's a real pleasure to um, welcome and introduce Rachel Reeves, who's uh, very kindly come to um, talk to us today on building a one nation economy. And this is the last event of this year's Festival of Politics and Applied Global Ethics, so I think it's a really good way to, to finish it off. Uh, Rachel is uh, a lifelong, I'll say a few things about Rachel and then uh, introduce her to speak. Um, Rachel's a lifelong member of the Labour Party. She joined in when she was 16. Um, she was elected to Parliament to represent Leeds West constituency in the 2010 general election, uh, taking the seat that was previously uh, held by John Battle, MP. She was also the, f or is, I should say, the first female MP representing Leeds since 1970, which is an interesting thing you might not have known. She is now um, Shadow Secretary for Work and Pensions, and before having been appointed uh, to that post in Ed Miliband's recent reshuffle. And before that, she was Shadow Secretary, <coughs> Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury. Um, before entering Parliament, Rachel's academic and professional background is as an economist. She did a degree in politics, um, philosophy and economics at Oxford, and then a master's in economics at the London School of Economics. And before entering Parliament, she worked as an economist for the Bank of England, uh, at the British Embassy in Washington, and for Halifax Bank of Scotland. So Rachel's going to talk about uh, One Nation, uh, and building a one nation economy. The concept of one nation, I said in the publicity, if you saw for this event, I said that that was a phrase that uh, Ed Miliband appropriated in his uh, 2012 Labour Party conference speech. And uh, those of you who are students of politics will know that uh, what I'm referring to there is that the notion of one nation is something we very much associate with the conservative tradition from the 19th century, particularly um, Disraeli. Uh, from 1845 in his book, Sybil, which talks about the two nations and so on. Um, but it's fair to say, and uh, since 2012, Rachel has co-edited a book uh, with Owen Smith uh, on One Nation, which you can download from the Labour Party website if you want to, or buy a hard copy. Uh, so it's obviously a key theme of uh, Labour politics now going forward to the next general election. Um, Ed Miliband in the preface to the book says it's not a conservative idea or a Labour idea, it's a, it's a British idea and of course it's true that uh, in the history of the Labour Party the concept of the nation and national interest has always been part of the language of the Labour Party as well as uh, ideas about class and, and working people's interests and so on. Of course that's always been a controversial idea, particularly those on the left of the party, both inside it and outside of it, have often criticised that kind of language of the nation and national interest. Uh, particularly on the grounds that it obscures or conceals the sort of kind of divided nature of society, uh, along particularly on class line, class line. So one of the critics who, take that, who took that kind of approach, of course, was Ralph Miliband, uh, Ed Miliband's father, who was, of course, recently so ignorantly attacked by the Daily Mail, that he represents that, or represented that kind of left-wing critique of Labour, which, which, if he were here today, I'm sure, would, would be saying that the concept of the national interest is quite problematic. Anyway, we're here today to learn about how uh, one nation, the concept of one nation, features in Labour Party politics today, and Rachel's going to very kindly talk to us about building a one nation economy. So I'm, I'm sure you'll all join me in welcoming Rachel. Thank you very much, Paul, and um, it's great to be here at Leeds Metropolitan University in honour to give the uh, annual politics lecture. Um, as a Leeds Member of Parliament, I know how well respected the politics department here is at Leeds Metropolitan. Uh, indeed, somebody who works in my office uh, did her undergraduate degree here in politics, and she now works for me helping constituents with their problems, whether it be housing, antisocial behaviour, immigration, or, or welfare issues. She had a fantastic time studying politics and history here, and she obviously learnt a lot, and she's a huge asset to me and to my constituents. Her name is Bryony, and she's passionate about politics, she's passionate about making a difference. When I hear people say that young people don't care about politics and are not interested in those sorts of things, I think about Bryony, 
and people like her. And it's fantastic to see so many young people here today who are at least intrigued by politics uh, to be studying it to come along to this lecture. And I hope that you will be the next generation of uh, politicians or at least uh, political advocates, people who challenge politicians and hold us to account. It's really ideas and energy, it's impatience with the status quo which drives things forward and makes the world a better place and it's what makes politics so exciting as well. Politics, I believe, I hope you do as well, can make a huge difference to our communities and to people's lives. In fact, I think it's only politics, or well, certainly ideas and energy and activism, and protest and door locking and speeches and getting involved that does change things. The reason that I got involved in politics is because when I was at school during the 1980s and 1990s, it was a time where there were huge cuts to public services, including to school budgets. My sixth form at school was two prefab huts in the playground. Our library was turned into a classroom because there weren't enough rooms in our school and there were never enough textbooks to go around. And it felt to me that that wasn't right, it wasn't fair, and it didn't enable people from all types of backgrounds, whatever their parents' income and wealth, it didn't enable all people to excel and to fulfill their potential. And that's why I joined the Labour Party, and that's why I got involved in politics when I was just 16. Politics and the country are very different places, uh, a very different place back then when I joined the Labour Party in the mid-90s. When I joined the Labour Party, only around 10% of MPs were women. And when I joined the Labour Party, the Conservatives had been in power for almost 18 years. When I got elected as the Member of Parliament for Leeds West, as Paul mentioned, I was the first woman to be a Member of Parliament in this city for 40 years. I'm only the second woman to represent any of the eight parliamentary constituencies in Leeds, and there's never been an MP in our city who isn't white. So politics is changing, but I don't think it's changing fast enough. Politics doesn't look like the country that it's supposed to serve. There are an awful lot of white, middle-aged, middle-class men. There aren't enough ethnic minority, young and women MPs. Things are changing, but at the current rate of progress, it will take around 100 years until there are an equal number of men and women in Parliament. It's a hundred years, almost, since the first woman got elected, and I hope it doesn't take another hundred years until there's an equal number of men and women in Parliament. I was asked to come and speak to you today, though, about One Nation Britain, and I think there's one idea more than any other that sums up that idea of One Nation, and that's the idea of the living wage. For me, the proudest achievement of the last Labour government was the creation of the national minimum wage. Before the creation of the national minimum wage, you could pay your employee anything that you liked, anything that you could get away with. The introduction of the minimum wage in 1998 changed all of that. And today, for over 21, the minimum wage is worth £6.31 an hour. But if between 1998 and today, the national minimum wage had kept pace with a pay of FTSE 100 directors, it wouldn't be worth 6.31 today, it would be worth 19 pounds an hour. And that shows to me that we need to redouble our efforts to ensure that everybody in our society, everybody who creates the wealth and income of our country, shares in, its, in our prosperity, shares in the growth. And right now, that's not happening. More than five million people in Britain are paid less than a living wage. A living wage is calculated as £7.65 outside of London, £8.80 in London. It's the wage that you need to survive on. It's the wage that you need to be able to feed yourself and your family, to pay the rent, to pay the bills. It's not asking too much, I don't think, in 2013, that people should be paid a living wage. And yet, one in four people in this country are not paid a living wage. And in Yorkshire, it's one in three people. It doesn't seem to me right the people who go out to work every day, who work hard, who play by the rules, who do the right thing, aren't taking home enough money to be able to live on. And it doesn't seem right that some people can earn millions of pounds each year, and in the same building, the same company, others don't earn enough to live on. For me, that really sums up the idea of One Nation, because One Nation 
It means that everybody in a country gets to share in the country's prosperity, gets to play a part in that economy. And that can't happen when inequalities are as wide as they are today. One of the early heroes of this living wage movement that has sprung up around the country is a man called Abdul. He is a cleaner in Canary Wharf. He worked at the bank HSBC and he earned the minimum wage. At that point, it was about £5.50 an hour. At the annual general meeting of HSBC, he stood up and asked the chairman how it could be fair that they both worked in the same office but lived in different worlds. Abdul woke up early to clean the offices before the other staff arrived and he earned a minimum wage. The chairman woke up early in the morning to see the latest news from the financial markets. He earned eight million pounds a year. They worked for the same company, they worked in the same office, but they had completely different opportunities and outlooks on the world. Yet they both had high aspirations for themselves and their families. They both worked hard, they both wanted a better future for themselves and their families. That meeting between Abdul and the chairman of HSBC was an important moment because now HSBC are a living wage employer because the chairman was struck by Abdul's question. And the chairman and Abdul now meet regularly to talk about pay and conditions at the bank. Abdul is now able to afford to take the tube to work instead of the bus, giving him an extra hour with his children each evening. It's not eight million pounds a year, but it makes a huge difference to him and to his life. And now, a few <coughs> years later, this is officially Living Wage Week. It takes place every year. This week, both Boris Johnson and Ed Miliband have made speeches making the case for a living wage. It's a powerful example of the supposedly voiceless building a campaign which is now central to our politics and our political discourse. So to all of you politics students, whatever your political party or your personal politics, don't let anybody tell you that your ideas, your ambitions to change the world are wasted. That depressing negativity, I think, has no place in the lively world of politics that we should all aspire to. Ideas matter. Commitment and campaigning of dedicated people is the only thing that makes a difference. If Abdul can do it, then all of us can. And today I want to talk to you specifically about ideas in tackling low pay and the importance of the living wage and building an economy that works for working people. At the moment, something is going quite badly wrong when it comes to pay and the cost of living. For the 40 months that David Cameron has been Prime Minister, in 39 of those 40 months, prices have risen faster than wages. He's broken all the records as Prime Minister who's been in power for more months of falling real wages than any other Prime Minister on record. The only month since David Cameron became Prime Minister where wages rose at a faster pace than prices was in April this year, when bankers deferred their bonuses from March to April to take advantage of the cut from the top rate of tax from 50 to 45p. So for everybody else, taxes are going up, prices are going up, but wages are going down. And yet the only people who have received a tax cut under this government are people who are earning more than £150,000 a year. In fact, the value of the national minimum wage in the last three and a half years has fallen by 5%. That's the reality of the unfair and unbalanced economy that we have. There are approximately 375,000 workers in Yorkshire who are paid less than £7.65 an hour, which, as I said, represents a third of the workforce. With the rising cost of living and cuts to social security, tax credits and housing benefits, an increasing number of households are being forced to rely on a minimum wage to be able to make ends meet, or they are turning to debt. David Cameron likes to talk about the global race, and we heard that in his speech at the Conservative Party conference this year. But I fear that we're losing in the race that matters most to families. Since the end of 2010, the UK has seen the biggest fall in workers' incomes of any country in the most industrialised seven countries, the G7. Gas and electricity bills have risen by £300 a year since David Cameron became Prime Minister, and four of the big six energy firms have already announced increases in prices worth between 8 and 10%, taking the cost of an annual dual fuel bill to over £1,400 for households. 
a picture is emerging in, in Britain of the so-called recovery that Cameron and Osborne are celebrating. But it's an economy that offers decreasing wages, increasing insecurity, higher bills, and wider inequalities. There may be a recovery for a few at the top, <coughs> but for most people on modest and middle incomes, this is no recovery at all. And for young people, the coalition government has been particularly damaging. Tuition fees, as you all know, have tripled, stifling aspiration and making it harder for young people to get on. The educational maintenance allowance, which did so much to ensure that more young people stayed on in education and were able to take advantage of those opportunities, was cancelled. Youth unemployment is approaching one million. More and more people, particularly young people, are on zero hours of contracts. And buying a house seems beyond the realms of possibility for most young people. A report from the consultancy KPMG shows that nearly three quarters of 18 to 21 year olds earn less than a living wage. So it's no wonder that people entering the job market for the first time are struggling to find the quality jobs. Since 2010, 60% of jobs created in our economy have been in low paid sectors of the economy. This does not feel like an economy that's working for ordinary people. It doesn't feel that hard work is being reward, rewarded. And there's a real sense of unfairness and injustice in the economy that we have today. That's why Labour and why Ed Miliband have spoken about building a new economy where everyone has a stake and everyone gets an opportunity to play their part. So why is confronting low pay so important for a fairer and more sustainable economy? Well, first and foremost, there's a moral argument. We can't be satisfied with a situation, and I'm certainly not, where an honest day's work does not bring home a decent pay. We need to support parents to have more time to spend with their family and children because they have to take a second job to be able to make ends meet. We want to help the young worker who wants to go to evening classes to improve their chances of progression, but instead has to take a shift at a pub to be able to pay the bills. It's about the women who clean our offices and universities before most of us are out of bed in the morning and who are still at work when we return home, perhaps on the supermarket tills. It can't be right that these people are working longer and longer hours but receiving less than a living wage. So it's also about caring and helping others. But it's also about us as a nation, as a collective, trying to take advantage of the talents we have. Too many people in this country aren't able to make the most of their skills, potential and talents. Recently I met a family. The father was once a partner in a thriving business but lost his livelihood during the recession three years ago. Desperately trying to keep up with the mortgage payments, he took any work that he could get, often through employment agencies, usually on zero hour contracts, predominantly on the minimum wage. His wife abandoned her dream of training to be a primary school teacher so that she could stay in her job, which was relatively secure, but modestly paid, working in a shop. Their daughter, is studying for her A-levels and wants to go to university, but she worries about whether she will be able to afford the fees. What a waste. What a waste of talent. Because we need an economy that takes advantage of these people's skills, makes the most of their skills and their talents, and that does not stifle ambition. I believe that it's only the Labour Party that has the ideas and the vision to ensure that families in this situation are given a fair chance. One example that has been much in the news recently has been around energy prices. And earlier today, I was out in Pudsey in West Leeds doing a petition to freeze energy bills. And earlier this week, I voted in the, um, in the debate in Parliament to freeze energy bills for 18 months. Ed Miliband has said that on entering Downing Street, the Labour Party will freeze energy prices for 18 months. He will act as Prime Minister by taking action against the energy companies who are ruthlessly increasing the bills whilst earning vast profits. This compares to the record of David Cameron, who his gut instinct and his very core tells him that he must just let the market play out. Don't intervene, don't confront the energy companies. I don't think he gets it. He doesn't get that all markets have rules, and the nature of those rules leads to very different outcomes, and it's up politicians to decide the rules of those markets. But we also need to tackle the other side of the equation. 
The cost of living is about the prices of everything. It's about the cost of rent. It's about the cost of the gas and electricity bills. It's about the cost of the weekly shop. But it's also about <coughs> pay. Confronting low pay is at the very DNA of what the Labour Party is about. Our party, my party, was born out of the self-organisation of workers in the 19th century. Sydney and Beatrice Webb, innovative political and sociological thinkers who formed the Fabian Society, made the argument that the livelihood of ordinary people could not be left to market forces alone, but that a doctrine of the living wage must be applied. In 1998, the last Labour government introduced the national minimum wage, a legacy that sits alongside the creation of the National Health Service as one of Labour's greatest ever achievements, ensuring that there was a statutory floor below which no worker could be paid. It raised the pay of millions, it reduced income inequality, and it helped narrow the gap in earnings between men and women. When Labour introduced the minimum wage, the Conservative Party said that it would create 3 million unemployed. They were wrong today, they were wrong then, and they are wrong today when they oppose the living wage. However, whilst it is critical to have a statutory wage floor, we must go further. The living wage, as I've already touched upon, exemplifies the spirit of a one-nation economy that Labour are attempting to build. There was an idea born in East London by community organisers, but it slowly, surely, built dialogues and coalitions with employers, employees, faith groups and others across the country. It's a modest ask. It's asking that people get paid 7 65 an hour outside of London, £8.80 in London. Last year at Labour Party conference, I met one woman who had benefited from the living wage. Her name was Fran and she worked at a college in Manchester. As a mum, she told me that money was so tight that she couldn't afford to go to the basketball ball matches that her two children played in. They were excellent basketball players. And she couldn't afford the boots and the equipment they needed to be able to compete. Before her small pay rise, she couldn't do those things. But now that she's paid a living wage, she can afford to take her kids to training and to watch their matches. It was a small increase in pay, probably not really noticed by her employers. But it's created huge new opportunities for her and for her children. And British businesses as well are starting to pay attention to this powerful campaign. There are now 400 employers across the United Kingdom who are accredited as living wage employers. Yet progress is being made, but it's being made slowly. We have seen commitment by some of the large financial services companies, 22 labour and local authorities and living wage employers, and many universities are moving in that direction. Intercontinental has become the first hotel group to pay the London living wage, with Whitbread, the UK's largest hotel and restaurant group, saying that they want to move towards it. And the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, who run care homes in the north of England, are also paying the living wage in one sector, social care, which has traditionally been one of the lowest paid. These far-sighted employees, employers, also see the benefits to their own businesses and organisations. 75% of employees who receive a living wage report an increase in the quality of their work. 80% of employers noticed an increase in productivity. And it's no surprise that when an employee feels valued, when they feel as if the work and effort they're putting in is being properly rewarded, they're more likely to step up to new tasks, to come to work more energised and enthusiastic and less exhausted if they can now work one job rather than trying to juggle two or three. And unions, trade unions, are also an important part of this movement, offering new methods of recruitment and organisation in retail, in care, and in local government. And the Labour Party are playing its part too, with local authorities from Lewisham to Preston, from Newcastle to Norwich, from Cardiff to Glasgow, and now York in the Yorkshire region, accredited as living wage employers. I know how difficult it is for firms, for universities, and for local government to pay a living wage during difficult economic times, but I think it's the right thing to do. Labour students have also been a big part of that campaign, and students on many campuses as well. I know students here at Leeds Met have been part of the campaign, and a group of Labour students at Leeds University are running a campaign to pay external contractors at the university a living wage and there's an event on the 13th of November to promote it. 
So this is a multifaceted campaign where everyone can play their part, businesses, employers, <coughs> unions, employees and students as well. And the government needs to play its part as well. This week Ed Miliband spoke about what Labour would do to ensure that more employers pay a living wage. For the first year of a Labour government, we will offer a tax rebate to employers if they sign up to pay a living wage. At the moment, for every pound that an employer spends on lifting wages from a minimum to a living wage, it saves the taxpayer 49 pence through higher tax and national insurance contributions and fewer payments of housing benefit and tax credit. So we've said that in the first year of a Labour government, we would give a rebate of 32 pence in the pound for any increase in wages above the minimum wage towards the living wage that an employer makes to their employee. It's good news for low paid workers who desperately need a pay rise. It's good news for employers who want to do the right thing, even during difficult economic times. And it's also good news for taxpayers who right now are subsidising low pay through tax credits and housing benefits. We're in the process of looking at other policies as well. For example, requiring big businesses to publish the number of staff who they employ at less than a living wage. A little bit like the kite mark of fair trade, enabling all of us as consumers to decide where we want to spend our money. Whether we want to spend our money in a retailer who pays their staff a fair wage, or whether we want to take our business elsewhere. But we also need to do more to enforce that statutory flaw of the national minimum wage. There have only been two prosecutions in the last three years for firms who don't pay a minimum wage, and yet we know that in every town and city there are people who are not being paid even that statutory floor today. So Labour would increase the current fine for not paying the minimum wage from £5,000 to £50,000 a year to incur <coughs> per employee to ensure that there is a tangible and real threat to unscrupulous employers who break the rules. Alongside those make-work-pay contracts, we'll be consulting on other methods to help pay the living wage. As I said at the beginning, the living wage is an idea that embodies the One Nation politics. It's an idea that began in the streets of East London, a subject of campaigns from across society, now being pursued by politicians in Westminster. The living wage was derived from a sense of injustice, and now it's at the heart of a vision for a new economy that can be fairer and benefit those people on the lowest incomes. I think it's an idea whose time has come, and I think it's something that everybody can be involved in, and it shows how politics at the grassroots can make a real difference and can affect real change. Thank you. Um, Rachel's got to be uh, away by about five o'clock, but we've got that means we have got uh, time for questions and uh, comments. So um, we've got about twenty minutes. So what I'd like to do is just ask for people to show their hands, and I'll can I take about three questions at a time. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And you can ask about anything. Rachel said, so it doesn't have to be about what she's just spoken about. I don't know if you mean that literally. Anything? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, so, <laughs> yeah, Alex at the back, and then here. Yeah, so we'll start with you. Susan. Um, you spoke about tuition fees. Um, does the Labour Party really have a credibility on the issue as they introduce tuition fees in the first place? Alex? That was nice and succinct. Yes, it was. That's good. That's what we want. <laughs> succinct questions. Okay. Yours isn't going to be, I guess. <laughs> it's going to be good for me, anyway. <laughs> um, you spoke about inequality and uh, welcome the things you said about um, living wage, but I wonder if you might extend that analysis to people who are unfortunate enough not to be working in the position that they're in. Yeah. Great. Yeah, succinct too. Specifically about the national living uh, wage and the fact you are going to mandate it, it's going to be a voluntary thing, and your commitment is to one year. Mm -hmm. um, so beyond that first year of the Labour administration, what would you plan to be? Yeah, fine. Okay, I'll take them in reverse order. Um, the Living Wage Foundation, who campaign uh, for, for the, the living wage and who run the Living Wage Week and uh, uh, the sort of grassroots movement, don't want the living wage to be um, statutory. They want to keep the minimum wage, but they don't think that should be the summit of the ambition. I think we should do more, but voluntarily, to get to um, a living wage. And I think that's right, because the way that the national minimum wage is calculated is it's calculated as what's affordable 
businesses across the country in uh, any part of the economy, and it's calculated in a way to avoid there being um, job losses. Uh, the living wage is calculated in a totally different way. It's calculated by what people need um, to, to live on. Um, uh, and of course, if you're not paid a living wage, you uh, get the tax credits and the, and the benefits to make up your um, income. I don't think we can move overnight to having a, um, a statutory minimum wage of £7.65. I think it would create uh, job losses, particularly at the moment when the economy um, is weak. But there's a number of things that I think that an incoming Labour government could do to ensure more people are paid a living wage. I've spoken about the, um, the, the contracts, the make work pay uh, contracts, and the reason why we've said that that should only be for year one is because we think it's also about businesses doing the right thing. It shouldn't be uh, the government moving the subsidy below pay from tax credits to a direct subsidy to uh, firms which should be trying to ask more of employers, and that's what I guess the sort of responsible capitalism theme is about, it's about employers playing their part as well. And all the evidence suggests that when employers become living wage employers, they don't turn back, but they stay as living wage employers. So we think that help in year one, especially because all the evidence also shows that businesses benefit from a living wage through higher productivity, lower turnover of staff, lower recruitment costs. So I think it's that right balance. But there are other things government can do as well. So there are now 22 Labour councils that pay a living wage to their staff, but central government isn't a living wage employer today. Uh, I, I don't think that's right. I met Cleaner earlier this week who cleans offices uh, in Whitehall, so employed by government, but she's not paid uh, a living wage. So I think we could learn from those local authorities and get the government as a living wage employer as well. And the third thing, which I did touch on in my speech, is around transparency. So big firms should have to publish the number of people in their firms who are paid uh, a living wage, because I think that will put a lot of pressure on uh, businesses to be responsible uh, employers. The second question was about uh, inequality and extending that to people who aren't working. Yeah, I mean, my politics is about the dignity of work and work for those who can and good quality jobs, paying a decent wage, not zero hour contracts, but good quality uh, jobs, but also uh, compassion and responsibility towards those people who can't work. Uh, now, I think there's far too many people at the moment who aren't working, who could work. We've got two and a half million people out of work, almost a million young people out of work. And Labour would guarantee a job to any young person who's been out of work for a year, uh, and guarantee a job for anyone over the age of 25 who's out of work for two years, because uh, if we learn anything from the recessions of the 80s and 90s, is that short-term unemployment can quickly lead to long-term unemployment and then becomes a lifetime of unemployment. So we must do more to ensure that more people are in work. And that includes people who sometimes get left behind, like people with disabilities, because many of them are desperate to work and want to work, but employers aren't making that possible for them and government aren't making it very easy for them as well. But for those people who can't work, absolutely, we need a safety net uh, and we need a social security system that offers those people dignity and fairness uh, as well. This week in Parliament, this week coming up in Parliament, uh, we've got a, um, a debate and a vote on Tuesday that I'll be leading for the Labour Party on the bedroom tax. Uh, now Labour have said that we'll cancel the bedroom tax if we get elected in May 2015, but by May 2015 the bedroom tax would have been uh, in place for 25 months and most people wouldn't have been able to get through those 25 uh, months and can't afford the bedroom tax today. So we're calling on Tuesday for the government to scrap that bedroom tax. That's just one example of, uh, of a, a way we would try and reverse some of the worst excesses of what this government um, um, are doing. But after five years of this government, you know, a lot of people would have already paid uh, the price. The third question was about tuition fees. Uh, I don't think the tuition fees should be reduced to zero. I think it is right that the cost of studying at university is shared between the state and those people who benefit from university. Still less than 50% of people in our country go to university. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think that those people who are fortunate enough to go to university should pay some of the costs towards uh, their university. Uh, tuition. I would like to see much more actually done towards the forgotten 50%, those 50% of people who don't get those opportunities that all of you and 
uh, I had as well. But I think the balance has swung too far in the other direction. I think £9,000 tuition fees are far too high. I know from my own constituency, which has got one of the lowest going to university rates in the country, that many young people who previously wanted to go to university now feel that that's out of reach for them. And many others who wanted to go to university away from home are now going to the local university, which might not be a bad thing, but you are closing down the opportunities to people from lower income backgrounds in a way that those opportunities are not being closed down to people in higher incomes whose parents can afford to pay you know, £9,000 and all the other costs associated with university tuition um, up front. So I wouldn't go back to um, you know, zero uh, fees. I think that the Labour government were right to share those costs of university tuition. But I voted, and all Labour MPs voted against the increase of £9,000, so I think that went too far. Ed Miliband, when he ran for leader of the Labour Party, spoke about introducing a graduate tax. I think that would be a fairer way of sharing uh, the costs of university, and it would uh, take away that feeling of having that debt, um, saddled with that debt for all of, all of, your, uh, all of your life, a debt that many people, um, um, you know, perhaps half the people in this room, will never pay um, back, and I, I don't think that that, that, that that debt is fair on young people when they're starting their working lives. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, second of the three. There, yeah, and then you, and then another one. Sorry. Must be somebody else. Not the back. Sorry, yes, Dan. <laughs> okay, so, uh, what did I say? Yeah, you talked earlier on about uh, the class capping the energy prices. Is there any plan like that on the petroleum, on petrol, you know, it's going up every time. Is there, what is the plan of labor regarding the petrol? Okay, petrol prices. Uh, okay, good. Nice and punchy, six in. Was there another one here? So that was the second one then. What about the NHS? What did you do about that? <laughs> okay, and then... Anything you were thinking about the NHS? Or just... You mean the, so the privatisation? Also okay. on the energy one, because even if, they, you, even if Labour offered to put a cap on it, um, I remember, I think it was said that, I'm not sure if, who said it, but even if you were to put, to suggest you put a cap on it, energy companies can still just back it up before you come back into power. Okay, so marketisation of the NHS, but you're sneaking two questions there, that's great. <laughs> Sneaky and then down at the back. Um, yeah, you mentioned at the start that there's a depressing negativity uh, about politics and uh, you know, the idea that you can change the world uh, isn't something really that motivates people. But I'm just wondering if the living wage uh, is a particularly inspiring idea. Uh, I mean, you mentioned yourself that it was very modest. Um, you weren't asking too much. Um, and you know, it makes me wonder, well, is it really enough then, just a living wage? You know? uh, and then it, I was thinking, well, who is the living wage actually for? You know, I mean, presumably you've done sort of focus groups about this and see what the voter response is. You know, what, what voting group is this aimed for? Is it aimed for the people who actually see an increase in their wage? Do you expect them to then vote later in sort of gratitude? Or is it more aimed for the middle class who can then feel less guilty about their privileges? Uh, and then the third question, if I can just sneak it in, was oh. is it the solution to the actual economic problems that we face? Uh, because you mentioned it could raise productivity. Well, the productivity question Really, surely that's the heart of the economic problem. You know, we've seen the expansion of the service sector, which is a very low productive, low wage, low profit sector. And surely that's the heart of the sort of inequalities that we've seen in society. Surely we need a dynamic manufacturing, high skills economy. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah, sure. Let me take the, the two questions about capping um, energy prices. Um, the lady said that. Um, couldn't energy companies just put up the prices um, beforehand? The reason we want to cap energy prices is we don't think the energy market works uh, today. So we wouldn't just cap prices for 18 months and then let them just do what they like. What we're saying is we're going to reset that energy uh, market. We're going to introduce a proper regulator, uh, different from off gym, that has proper teeth and can actually stop these energy prices that we're seeing at the moment of 8 10%. Uh, but also, we would introduce uh, proper competition into the industry because at the moment you've got you know an oligopoly, just six companies uh, um, um, acting, and when one puts up the prices, the rest of them do. That's not proper uh, competition. That's not proper market. And you've also got this integration between the people who produce the energy and then sell it on. So uh, Edmund Van has said that we would introduce uh, a, a proper market that anybody can enter 
to sell that uh, gas and electricity onto the consumers. So it's not just about freezing prices, it's about changing the whole energy market. But for the first 18 months, if Labour were elected in 2015, we'd freeze prices and then use that 18 months to set up a new regulator uh, and, a, and a new market. Yeah, but as I think it's actually Ed Miliband that I watched it, Well, that's what's, going to that's what's going to happen this winter because energy prices have gone up by 10%. You've got an, an energy regulator that is unable to, to stop it. Well, well fr freezing it uh, would make it much better than going up by 10%, and that's what's going to go up by this winter, 10%. Uh, freezing energy prices uh, would make a difference uh, uh, by the tune of probably about £120 uh, a year, which if you're on a low income will make a huge difference. But we're not <laughs> happy with just freezing prices. We want a market that works properly with a regulator who stops these price increases <coughs> that you've spoken about uh, happening in the future. So it's a two-pronged approach. It's about freezing in the short um, term, but the prices never come down um, on these energy companies. It's about freezing in the short term and then getting a proper energy regulator that will stop the, uh, the profiteering uh, and, the, uh, and the oligopoly that we've got um, um, at the moment. Uh, and you know, if an energy company in April 2015 put up their prices by 10%, there's no reason why an income and Labour government couldn't uh, then you know, legislate that those prices had to fall. Um, but what we're saying is that we freeze those energy uh, prices and then reset uh, the market to make it fairer for uh, consumers. Uh, the, the second part of the question on energy prices was petrol. Uh, and you know, you're right that petrol prices uh, have also been going up, and it's another one of those markets which I don't think um, works very well. Uh, it didn't help when the government increased VAT from 17.5% to 20% because obviously VAT is applied on uh, petrol prices, and that put, I think, three pence on the litre uh, of, of, of petrol. But I also think we need to do more to invest, actually, to go back to the other question as well. Need to do more to invest in uh, in renewable sources of energy, and need to do more to uh, improve public transport infrastructure. Uh, because at the end of the day, the world does have finite resources of uh, fossil fuels, and unless we uh, diversify and use uh, solar and wind power, uh, unless we get more people using buses and trains rather than using their cars uh, all the time, then we're just get, prices will go up. Uh, further. So we need to do those things as well. And when the government say we're going to cut energy bills by getting rid of the uh, green investment, actually in the long run that is no good for consumers. Because if we are reliant on fossil fuels and we're reliant on imports from uh, the, the Middle East and Russia, then in the long run our prices will go up uh, further. So yes, you can do something to tackle with the short run prices, but I think also you need to change the market. It actually links to the other question as well about what sort of economy do we want. Uh, because I think after the financial crisis, we do need to think about uh, a better balanced economy that's less reliant on financial services and London and the South East, and has jobs in a wider range of sectors across the whole country, including in manufacturing, uh, pharmaceuticals, creative industries, where UK has huge strengths, but strengths that have been neglected. But that said, you know, there are very high skilled service sector jobs as well, and we shouldn't think that all service sector uh, jobs are low productivity uh, jobs, they're not. Uh, uh, you know, in some service sector uh, industries, we are world leaders, and even in financial services, which obviously gets quite a hard time at the moment, uh, in insurance and, uh, and, and, and other industries, we are uh, global leaders and we shouldn't neglect the strengths, including in leads that we have um, in those. On productivity, I do think that the living wage and all the evidence from the firms that have implemented um, improves productivity. But the real reason that I don't think wages have gone up is not because workers aren't productive enough. I think the real reason wages haven't gone up is that the bargaining power of workers is so weak and the, uh, and the bosses take all of the, um, all the benefits with big pay increases for themselves. I mean, does anyone really think that bosses' productivity has gone up by 50% in the last three years? I don't. And yet that's what their wages have gone up. 
whilst people on low incomes haven't seen any increase in wages at all. So I actually don't think that the low pay argument is um, primarily a productivity uh, argument. Uh, I think it's an argument about uh, uh, an economy that just isn't working for ordinary people, whether they be consumers of gas and electricity or whether they be workers on modest and middle incomes. On the privatisation of the Royal Mail, I, I, I opposed it in, in Parliament. I've campaigned in my constituency uh, uh, um, for the government to rethink. I think the Royal Mail should remain in, in state uh, hands. I think uh, it's, uh, it's uh, an institution that, you know, like the NHS in some ways, that uh, people feel real affinity to and want it to be owned uh, um, in, the, in the public uh, domain rather than for private profit. I also have very real worries about what will happen to um, the universal posted, uh, postal service. We've already seen big increases in prices of stamps just before privatisation. Uh, I expect that that will continue and I also expect to see a fragmentation of, uh, of that universal service that exists at the moment. I also think it's criminal that they've sold it off so cheaply when they didn't even get the value for taxpayers uh, that they should have done. So if you are going to privatise it, at least privatise it well and make sure that you bring in money to invest in other public services, which is what they've failed um, to do. But similarly, on the, the NHS, I mean, we've had such massive arguments in Parliament about the uh, reorganisation of the National Health Service, a uh, uh, reorganisation that's costing £3 billion at the same time that there are 6,000 fewer nurses than there are three years ago. What I think the priority should be for the National Health Service is integrating health and social care. I think the real worry at the moment is that you've got far too many elderly people and people with long-term conditions who end up in hospital who should be being treated in their community, but because of cuts to social services at a local level, they end up uh, in hospitals. So the number of people over the age of 90 going to A&E has increased by 100,000 in the last year. Now, people of that age should not be in A and E uh, at uh, LGI. They should be getting the support they need in their homes and in their communities. And if the government have got three billion pounds to spend in the National Health Service, they should be spending that money in integrating health and social uh, care in the same way that the Labour Party created the National Health Service in 1948. We should be today creating a national care service uh, of the same level of, of ambition to support people uh, when they're most vulnerable. And would you leave the reforms in place in terms of opening? No, I mean, we've said that we would repeal the Health and Social right. Care Bill right. uh, if we're um, elected in 2015. Uh, and you know, we oppose the, 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 the privatisation. And the, again, it's a bit like the, 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 the post office and the Royal Mail oppose the fragmentation of the service. What would be your structural, another structural change? You know, the, the, every three years a structural change in the NHS, which is what is costing you three billion pounds, just leave it as it is, repeal some of the yeah. some of some of the some of the uh, sort of market led reforms but leave the structures. I mean I, it, I, yeah, I mean I, I take I take your point. I mean it's the same with um, you know an area where I, I've had more involvement around um, regional economic development. You know, the government got rid of the regional development agencies and replaced it with local enterprise partnership. I preferred what you had before. But we're not going to come in 2015 and rip up all of the new infrastructure and try and recreate uh, something that's, uh, that's gone. So you have to work with the government we've got. Right, I'm sure there are more questions, but I'm afraid we're going to have to try to oppose that because Rachel just have to get off to another commitment. So um, I'm sure we will agree it's been a really good way to finish off the festival and our final event. So I'm sure we'd all like to thank Rachel for taking the time to come to us.